you know, this, this, this presentation will uh, center around testing code. And we have already, so some of the code, or some of the projects you saw testing we have seen before, right? So that's why this is going to be a little bit faster. And uh, I have a few other projects and a few other, um, well, actually, sample applications on the same GitHub repository that I showed before. I think that the link will be appearing in just a moment. So you will see all the uh, different things that you can do. Now, let's see. Uh, same basic idea, yada, yada, you know this. I hope that I was able to do this in the past. We'll see. Okay, you know that. Okay, the, again, that's the link where you can get all the information, the, all the different projects. And uh, all of that, again, is open source. So that should be a problem. If you find an issue, if you would like to have a new feature or something like that, please let me know. Send me a pull request. It's all open. Okay. So the first thing is assertions. Uh, because one of the things that we need to do with our test cases is to figure out if the code is doing the right thing. Now, I am culprit because I did this in the past when I was learning and I saw also my teammates to do the same thing. Uh, when, they, when they told us, the management said, you need to write tests. Sure, I'm going to use JUnit3 and that's it. And uh, we executed our code and then we verified that the code was doing the right thing using printouts. Yeah, it kind of works, but it didn't. Right? So you have to use proper assertions. Now, JUnit 3 and 4 have an entry point for assertions is called uh, the assert equals method, which you can use in many ways, but there's another project that you have seen before called Hamcrest that allows you to do this thing, the one in blue. That's, uh, in this presentation, whatever you see in blue is what is specific to that particular project. So those are the same, same setup as before. And uh, we have some, some class under test, and we verify that that thing is doing what it's supposed to be doing, so returning a value that is equal to that thing. Now, uh, Hamcrest is quite extensible, and uh, pretty much everybody knows it. The problem with Hamcrest is that when an assertion error occurs, the generated message may not be as descriptive as you want. Believe me that this is much better than what we used to have before. Before Graham Hamcrest, we had to have the expectation and the actual value. And the generated error would say, assertion file error, this value, that value, not equal. And then what? So the description was kind of lost. Hamcrest gives you a more descriptive error message. If this fails, it will tell you expected value test, but actual value, the other one. Uh, pretty much gives you descriptive conditions and it's easily extensible and comes bundled with JUnit 5, uh, sorry, JUnit 4, so you don't have, even have to define an additional dependency for this. But, given that it's a little bit difficult or not really nice kind of messages that you produce with Hamcrest, there are a few other projects that, I, that you can have a look at. For example, AsserJ. AsserJ uh, has also its own assert method it's done in this way so that you can just replace the uh, original import for the other. But notice what is different here, is that here's the, serv the invocation, this is the value, and what follows is a fluent interface. And this method can only be invoked based on the type that we have here. So if this were to be a collection, then I would have access to the size of or, or the uh, size equal to method or something like this. If it were to be a map or a match or something else, then I would have access to different collection of methods that make no sense to the other one. Uh, and this eventually will allow me to continue doing more assertions for the same value. The messages provided by SRJ are a little bit better than Hancrest, but the most important thing, the most important feature provided by SRJ is the capability to do the assertions in a fluent interface design. Acer J was inspired by another project called FEST, FEST Assert, which is a swim based project. And now, well, it works for any kind of Java project. The author of FEST Assert uh, joined Google some years ago. And I don't know if it was a direct influence by him 
or because some persons, some people at Google discovered uh, AsserJ and FestAssert, they decided to create an own version called Truth. What is the main difference between AsserJ and Truth? Well, looks exactly the same, isn't it? And the entry point, well, it's different, but it's the same name. So technically speaking, speaking, they are the same thing. Actually, they are inspired by Fest. They are based on the same code, but the type of messages that you can do with AsserJ, the Google uh, Truth, are much more descriptive. And it has uh, some additional features that AsserJ does not give you. So regardless of this, if you use uh, Hamcrest, AsserJ, or Truth, you have now three different options to do your assertions. And the last thing that I want to say about Truth is that even though Hamcrest and AsserJ are extensible to using your own custom uh, conditions and extensions, the way that you extend Truth perhaps is much friendlier to the developer, in this case yourself, the ones that need to create these kind of conditions. Yeah, and the last thing, the, the another advantage is that it's supported by Google. So if you like the, the stuff that is produced by Google, and if this thing is good enough for the big projects that they have at Google, then it might be good enough for your own projects as well. Anybody here use Go, the programming language? Yeah? So you know that in Go, we have a, a baked in or built in version of testing that is quite easy to get started. So one of the features one that, uh, the, that they have is that you can run a test and do a bunch of assertions together and have one single point of failure instead of multiple. Because what we have told, been told in the past in the, with JUnit is that it should have as little assertions as possible in the same test method. Because if we say we have five assertions and the third one fails, what happens with the fourth and the fifth? They don't get executed, right? But what if we want all those five to be executed regardless of the state of the other ones? We need some, something like the concept of soft assertions. This is something that AsserJ gives you. This is something that Truth also gives you. Nothing that Hamcrest gives you. But Go test gives you that, and JGo testing gives you that as well. So how does this thing work? You use a JUnit rule to instantiate a JGo test rule, give it any name you want to. Use test or T, which is the convention in Go test. And then you can log as many me messages as you want. This is just a printout of any statement. And then notice that we do fluent interface chaining of these methods. You can do test, assert that, or check. It's up to you. Because the concept behind a JGo testing and, and Go test is that instead of following just one check, one, you want to do some multiple checks. Say, for example, you got a car. This is the, 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 three, the basic example. If there is something wrong with your car and you don't know, what do you do? You go to the mechanic and say, here's my car, please fix it. And then what does the mechanic do? The first thing is he's going to check, oh, let's do a, a, a surface uh, review. And then, ah, I see. One of your taillights is broken. OK. Then what happens? Does he simply stop there so they fix it? No. And continues going, and oh, there's a problem with your motor, and there's some problem with this, and, that, and gives you a full list of all the things that need to be fixed, right? It's exactly the same idea. You got a production test class, you run it, there may be five problems with this thing, you just get run all the checks, and then you say, boom, five errors. Instead of the first error, fix, ah, oh, another error, fix. So the feedback loop is faster. That's the whole point, to make sure that you get information as soon as possible. So with this thing, we can use handcrest matchers, or we can use Boolean expressions, or we can pass the value directly. And at the end, all these things will be evaluated, and you will get a full report of all the things that failed, thanks to that uh, rule. If by any chance there is an error, and any kind of exception that occurs, during this execution, it will be also caught by this one. But unfortunately, once that error occurs, and if you have other code and any other checks, those checks will not be able will not be executed because the whole method aborted using an exception. All right. So now let's go into general. Um, this is a, a pointer to the same application that we saw before, the GitHub API. And uh, as I say, it's quite the same thing. 
So we saw JUnit params now. We saw much better what needs to be changed. So the things in blue. So we know this. Then Mokito. Again, the things in blue, just a quick refresher. I promise there is new content coming up. And uh, Yukito, all the things that are different. Spock, for which I will show you a different way to do the parameterization because you can do it in this way, which kind of like, looks weird, right? Because of, of these characters. What about that? Does it look better? Okay, have a look again. Odd. Data table. Huh? Huh? Same thing, right? But now it's much better to see, okay, so for all the values of the input variable, for this will be the first test row, and so that's also output, and here's the second row, and third, and fourth, and whatnot. And you can have as many columns as you want. Much, much better. Bad? Good. There we go. That's what I like, Spark. It allows you to do great things like this one. Um, okay, we saw that. Iowa utility, we saw that too. Warmock, we saw that too. Now comes the good thing. Let me see if I got this application going. It's uh, the to-do example one. And uh, we do a run, I believe. This is a web application using the Spark Java framework, just because it's very easy. And uh, now I'm going to say curl localhost 8080, and um, I think it's to do's. Oh, oh no, sorry, that's not the port. Uh, 4567. Silly me. Four, five, six, seven. And we got a JSON payload. Nice. But uh, I, I will gonna make a fool out of myself, try to remember how to define a header. I think is accept content type text HTML. Is this the right way to do it? Yeah. Here we go. Now it gives me the same content, but using HTML. Okay, so my application is a little bit smart. It knows how to do content negotiation. Ooh, so uh, early 20s. Uh, all right. Now, what I'm gonna do is, let's kill the application. And uh, I showed you the code for this application. Uh, here we go. It also uses juice. Let's make it smaller. Like this. And there's a Spark Java. There's some bootstrap for, for the data. And that's pretty much it. Well, wow, that's cool. Because the important thing is in this object called routes. So let's go into uh, Spark and routes. And here's this class. And this class is just an interface, aha, uh -huh. so it's coming from, um, from this, which gives me access to the actual uh, rat, uh, spark behavior. Okay, so we're getting further down the rabbit hole. So the actual implementations in, in found in these classes, so these are interfaces, though the default method are this one, so perhaps let's go with the list. The list does this. This is a Spark Java object, nice. Creates a POJO, adds it to the model, and returns it using a repository. And what is the to-do repository? That's where we start getting into JPA or some other means. Actually, this, this project makes use of another library called SQL 2.0, which are very lightweight SQL to object mapper. It's not really an ORM, but it's quite small and quite fast. So for in order to do this testing, if we need to test the uh, repository, which is right here in the database, that interface. We need to test this interface, and we need to test the application. So testing the interface of the repository, that's not a problem because that's plain Java object. So that's it. Let's see, we use Jukito, okay. 
and we define a custom test module. We'll see that in a moment. So you remember Yukito is JUnit, Juice, and Mokito together. So these injections will come out from the uh, Juice injector. We invoke the bootstrap, so we got some basic data, and then we start to do assertions with a repository. And uh, for example, we can do the find all, there's handcrest matchers, another matcher, then we save, we find, and we start to do things. And then the next thing is this module that we saw before. Here's something that Yukito allows me to do, is that I can override default bindings for a particular module. So for the case of the bootstrap, instead of using the real production bootstrap, we're going to use this class, which is right there, which does nothing. Did we do this because this app module here, this is the production module, it does define a concrete binding for this interface that will do the right thing in production. But we want to change this for testing code. All right, so again, this is just like an irregular Java code. What if we were to test out the actual route? This will require the real, op the real server, don't we? And uh, let's see what happens if we run the test case. Uh, it's kind of working. There's one test executed. Then the other one. Come on. Waiting, waiting. Everything's successful. You, you trust me? I said you trust me. You kind of do. You shouldn't. Never trust a test you haven't seen fail once. Let's make sure that this thing fails. Um, do we have no null value? Not null value. Change this condition to that. Run it. And we should get at least one failure. And uh, there we go. Yes. It fails. Now we know the test was OK. There's the other one, the application test case. This one tests out the application object itself. So if we see the application, it's this. So this is kind of like an integration test case where we need the real repository, the real routes. So we need to hit the real server somehow. So we need some kind of client. Remember, we are building a web application. We need a client that we can use some uh, with fake queries, perhaps. All right? And that's exactly what we do here. Okay, you see Jukito, here's the application object. We start it, we finish it, and here comes the Groovy. And by Groovy, I mean actual Groovy code. This looks like Java, it is Java code, but the code that is behind this implementation is Groovy code. Given certain port, when that particular URL is invoked, then I expect somebody using this notation, this code right here is actually run by Groovy code inside. But you don't have to be aware that it's Groovy code, but it's cool. And then again, using handcrest matches, we make sure that these values get transformed into what, the right thing. And here's another one when we expect, this is when it's empty. And this is when we create a new item. So we post, we expect the list to contain now more values. So the great thing about this is that because Spark Java is so easy to get started, for the test case, we can start the real server and shut it down. What is new here is this API. This is known as REST Assured, which is exactly this thing. REST Assured is a DSL for defining web clients on which you specify your expectations. You can configure the uh, delays and timeouts and the port, and then you can, you can do get, post, put, delete. You can do all the, the HTTP verbs, and then you can verify on the body using simple expressions. So regardless of the, remember that the response is XML or actually HTML or JSON. If I pass an additional header here, if I were to return XML, the format, at least in terms of the content, is quite similar to JSON in the sense that there is a to-dos container that has to-do items that have description property. 
what is going on here, this is known, well, if it were XML, you know you can use something called XPath. But in, in JSON, there is something called JSON path. And in Groovy, we have something called GPath, which works for a graph of objects. What's happening here, when well, I mentioned that there's some Groovy behind, is that the actual implementation is intelligent enough to figure out, oh, it's XML, I do this. If JSON, I do that. If it's an object notation, then I do the other thing using JSON path and GPath. So you can switch here to JSON or XML or the other. Your expression will be exactly the same. <clears throat> so it allows you to validate JSON, XML, and HTML. Here's another thing, because it's very unlikely that you're using Spark Java. Probably you're using a standard Java EE or a Spring Boot. If it's a Spring Boot, it comes with its own testing facilities, which I'm not going to discuss here. But who's using a standard Java EE? Wow, no one. Interesting. What you guys are using besides Spring Boot? Is there something else? Drop Wizard? Uh, what else is out there? J Hipster? Grails? Come on. You're, I, you're not web developers? <laughs> wow. OK, cool. Well, if you have to work with Java EE, the problem with Java EE is that you have to run your application on a container. So in order to test this thing, you have to have a container. How do we set up a container in the right way so that we can have the application in the correct state in order to run the test case? That is the problem. But there is a solution. That solution is called Archelian. It's the test framework that we're going to see next. And for that, I got another version of the application. This is a standard Java EE application. Uh, let's see, da, 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 da. that also uses juice, uh, here's the servlet, and uh, here's my to-do servlet, let's make it bigger, uh, let's expand this a little bit, alright, so it's a regular servlet that has injection, that has its own routes, it has a bootstrap, and does the handling. That looks a little bit like that, what we saw in Spark Java. But how we handle this in the default list route, exactly the same as before. Grab a reference to the repository, then pass everything, and then send it to something that looks like a model and view. This is a specific to this class here, to this application. The simple POJO again with our good friend Lombok. And we go back here, and uh, wow, what is this thing? Uh, no, do the list. Here, we got another interesting project called Mustache. Anybody done Mustache templates in JavaScript? They're quite good, quite fast. Mustache Java is very, very fast. The best, fastest templating solution for Java. Anyway, going back to this is how do we run this application? We need to have a real container. But if we use Archelian, not a problem. For example, here's my test case. Uh, looks pretty much exactly as the other one, isn't it? The difference is that we're using the, uh, another uh, port because I'm running this test case embedded in Tomcat. Okay, so that's exactly the same. What about the other thing? This, my friends, is how we can tell Archelian to create the web application, the WAR file, that is going to be deployed on a particular container. If you're using Maven, which I guess most of you use Maven, I suppose, then Archelian knows how to resolve all the dependencies that need to be added to the dependency. It's quite easy. But because I'm using Gradle, I need to do extra stuff. Say, here's the way, where is the way for Maven? Here's the, where the way for Maven, by the way. You do Maven Resolver, and then you can give it the name on the POM file, or the, the location of the particular POM file, and tell it, give me all the test uh, dependencies, or all the runtime dependencies, that will grab all the locations of all the jars. You will have them here, and that's just added to the web archive. I'm doing this because I'm running with Gradle, so I don't have a POM file. And then also with Gradle, I grab all the dependencies that are needed for runtime. There we go. So what else do we do here with this archive? 
uh, we say that it's a web archive, so it's a war that contains that particular resource, so we'll see what is in that resource, and then we're also going to add another resource, a web XML, and add all the files, and also where else, uh, where are the classes? Uh, this gives me all the classes right here that I need. Okay, so everything is fine, and this will generate a wire that gets automatically deployed to a container, and there are three modes to run the container. Embedded mode inside the test case. For every test method, a new container is going to be started, deployment is made, test case run, done. There is the manage version, where you got a, re, uh, a local container installed on your machine that is uh, shut down, it's not running, and when you run the test case, the test case will run the container, do the deployment, and run the test cases. And the final thing is the remote. You got a container already running somewhere, it might be on the same machine, or machine on another server, and the test case will do the deployment to that location and run the test cases. So let's see what happens when I run. Uh, and let me make a mistake here. For example, add Java doc one. You could never trust a test case you haven't seen fail once. Okay. Hopefully, Gradle will not gobble up all the um, messages because by this moment, it will try to launch Tomcat, do the deployment, and then run the test case. You can further configure Archelian with some resource files like this one, where I'm telling which kind of mode I'm running, Tomcat, on that port, and that's everything that I need to do. So this is a resource that is going to be found automatically by Archelian. You can have different containers with different names, with different settings, so you can have a manage, a, con an a managed version, a remote, or an embedded one, as much as you want. And uh, it fails. Perfect. Uh, build uh, reports test test uh, index HTML. There we go. Uh, takes a moment. And of course, there's the assertion failure that we got. And uh, in the standard output, what is this printout? This is printing out the contents of the WAR file, so we can verify that it contains all our production classes, which are these classes right here, and that all the jars that are needed. Where this thing is coming from? Uh, where is the test case, application test case? It's this line right here. I, I like to use this so that I can quickly verify if it has the right contents or at least what appears to be the right contents. Because you can shrink, if you don't need a whole application, you can say, well, perhaps I'm just testing, testing a small subset, so I want to include these classes of to here, or, or this package, or exclude this package perhaps, but include the other one. So you're free to do all that, that is needed in order to create the deployment. Okay, so that's basically Archelian. And the other miscellaneous options. Uh, so any of you have had the need to create a PDF and then assert that it has the right contents? Well, if you ever had the need, know there is something called PDF unit. PDF unit, it's aware of the document model of PDF. So say that somehow you, you have, a, have generated a PDF using some reporting mechanism, like Jasper reports or something like that. Then, uh, you create an object of type page region and start doing assertions like this. What is the document on the test? It will read all the document and start to look at the different elements. So you can figure out if it has the right number of columns and if there is a value in the right cell where it's suspected. Instead of doing a visual verification. That is much better, I would say. There's another one called XML unit. I would expect that sometimes you need to work with XML and that you need to verify that it has the right contents, right? XML unit does it for you. So in this case, we had to extend from XML test case. Uh, there is no way to do composition, it has to be inheritance. 
we have some basic content here. This is a this is actually a real test case for an older project that I have. Remember that I mentioned that Java has like just a few, actually a lot of Java libraries. There is a real test case for a project called JSONLib. It's uh, the third project that created JSON to Java and Java to JSON and then added XML. I know it for a fact because I'm at the author, it's kind of like 10 years old. And so when I brought this test case, I needed to figure out that XML was written correctly from Java and JSON. So this thing serializes some Java objects from JSON to uh, XML, so that's the JSON, then writes it at XML, and then needs to verify that the response, that thing, is actually the same thing as that. And there are more things that you can verify with XML, but at least you can check that it has the right number of tags and it has the right content. And with that, I promise that I was gonna make it this quick, it was close to half an hour, I want to close down that again, let me remind you that everything is open source. You can use it right away. Uh, if you can contribute to open source, the easiest way that you can contribute is report an issue if you find it. Please give as much information as possible, what the running environment or what happened, the steps to reproduce. The next thing to do is get in touch with the, with the community, get in touch with the authors and, and the project team so that you have a conversation going on, and if you can supply a test case, and if you can supply a patch, that would be great. But again, the easiest thing to do is just submit an issue or a file, or file a report if you find something. We all benefit because of open source. And uh, I think that's pretty much it, what I have. Thank you very much for listening my rambles for close to two hours. And again, let me repeat that I'm very happy to be here. I'm here for two weeks. So if you want to continue hear me rambling on on different projects and some of the stuff, please let me know. I'm available for the next following weeks. Thank you.